Injuries and also on physiology of uh, handball conditions. So the best way is I'm going to ask uh, Professor Royal Byer to come up to the podium and we'll make sure we have the slides and we'll ask people to come inside now for this. Good morning, uh, everyone. It seems like uh, most of the crowd is still out there enjoying the coffee. So I've been instructed to just keep talking uh, so they can hear that I've started to talk uh, while they're trying to bring them in. My topic this morning is uh, concussion. And the first question is, of course, is concussion a problem in handball? My answer to that is I have no idea. And you may think that I've been selected to give this talk because I'm a concussion expert. Well, I am not, as I will show you in a minute. What I do know though, and as we saw from yesterday, in Marcus Valdain's talk, concussions do occur in handball. And this is one example. If you can start this video, please. And you'll get this uh, again. Uh, you can see the typical writing reflex as he's down there on the, uh, on the floor. Gets hit with an elbow and a double bang hits his head on the pitch as well. And you see this typical writing reflex, which is a, uh, a sure diagnostic sign of a concussion. Now, there's no data on the incidence of concussions in, in handball. Uh, but from people in the audience, I've learned that we have had at least two substantial concussions in the handball world championships to date. And I'm sure there are other minor head injuries as well during the tournament, which the injury registration hopefully will help us document over the next few days. Now, one admission. I was not really selected or invited to give this lecture. I think I'm actually the seventh person. Uh, so they started at the top of the list and they couldn't make it. I think the top of the list was Winna Moivissa and Paul McCrory. And when they were unavailable, they went to number three, uh, unavailable, four, unavailable, five, unavailable. I think it's seven, isn't it? Seven. Uh, so this, this came to me and I said, sure. I'll do it. And I think I am the perfect person to do this lecture because I'm somebody like you, somebody who is treating athletes with concussions on a daily basis, but not really as an expert in the field. So instead of me telling you how you should be doing this, I will be trying to help us explore this topic together. So this will be an active participatory exercise for the next 25 minutes or so. And what we're going to explore is one, specifically, one of the tools that have been developed to help us as clinicians to diagnose and manage concussions in athletes. 
And these three tools have, are the result of, I think, the biggest success story in sports medicine in modern times. In the sense that I don't think any part of sports medicine has been through such a revolution in such a short time and where the world of sports medicine has gotten together, agreed, this is how we should be doing things and then created tools allowing us all over the world, across language barriers and cultures, to do things in the same way. So I think this is the, most, the, the, the part of sports medicine that has advanced the most in this past period since the first consensus meeting in 2001 through follow-up meetings in 2004, 2008, and the fourth one in Zurich in 2012, which resulted in a supplement with a series of papers underpinning this common clinical approach to concussion, which has been jointly published in all the major sports medicine journals and that are available to you without any limitations of copyright and, and uh, that sort of thing. There are three tools. I'll cover one of them in detail, and the other two just go through them briefly. So the pocket concussion recognition tool is a tool that has been created for anyone to use. And the thought is that this will be particularly helpful for lay people, so that's parents and coaches, in managing kids on the sideline who are bang, get a bang to the head and to help them decide whether this child has a concussion or this adult, for that matter, has a concussion and should be managed by a health professional or not. So the pocket concussion recognition tool is quite simple. It has, uh, it's, a, it's sort of a, a list of reminders of things to look for. And the most important thing of this document is that it says if a concussion is suspected, this child or this athlete should not go back to play, but should be seen by a health professional. All right, so that's the pocket concussion recognition tool aimed at lay people. The most important tool for us is the SCAT tool, the Sport Concussion Assessment Tool. And what you have in front of you on all the tables, I hope, is the SCAT 3 form. I'll refer to that uh, lately, uh, shortly. And the 3 means this is the third version of the SCAT form and the one that we should be using currently. So when should this tool be used? Well, I think the one thing I've learned myself as a practitioner is that the most helpful thing of the SCAT3 tool, <coughs> excuse me, is that it allows us to do serial measurements and through serial measurements see the dynamic or, or, or get evidence for the dynamic nature of a concussion, how the concussion evolves from the time of the, uh, of the incident and over the next days and weeks as the athlete gets better. Importantly, this is not a sideline assessment tool. This is something that should be done in a quiet and you will get that feeling short to yourself, rest, resting environment, and at least 10 minutes post-exercise. One of the questions that often come up is, is a baseline assessment helpful? And many people feel that it is. So if you're involved in a high risk, in, if you're involved in ice hockey, for instance, which has a very high rate of concussions, it may be helpful to do this assessment on all the athletes pre-season so you know what their normal state are. Because that can sometimes be difficult to assess if you're doing this on someone you don't know. And it is now available in multiple languages, and there is a website where you can download uh, the various uh, language uh, versions, 
and it should be done in the athlete's native language, if at all uh, possible. So, this is where it starts. This is the SCAT3 tool. It's a four-page layout. The first page is about the sideline assessment. So it's the health professional ver version of, this, of the pocket recognition tool, if you like. The second part, the second page, is the scoring page where you actually do the scoring of the athlete. And the third page, perhaps the most important page, which can make us all confident that we can use this tool, is it has all the instructions, the detailed instructions of how you do the tests and how you perform the exam are on page three. And then page four is also very helpful because that's information to the patient that you can give to the patient uh, that will help the patient uh, understand what they should do and what they should not do after your examination. So first, the sideline uh, assessment. And this is basic stuff that we have learned uh, in medical school uh, uh, as, um, as health professionals. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to be very brief on, on this. Uh, the signs of concussion, if you have a look at this uh, part here, uh, you will see that just from, if you're, the, if you're the team physician and you witness that accident that we saw uh, on the video of the Swedish player getting uh, hit to the head, you can immediately this, uh, diagnose that there has been a concussion in this case from the athlete's behavior immediately after getting hit. There are some uh, uh, scoring tools that are used. The Glasgow Coma Scale is, of course, uh, not very helpful, usually, uh, with sports concussions. Uh, it is a very uh, coarse instrument. It measures eye response, verbal response, and pain response. Uh, so very helpful, obviously. In, with severe brain injury, uh, but with mild traumatic brain injury or concussion, uh, the score is normally maximal, 15 out of 15. Maddox score, on the other hand, I found is very helpful as a sideline, as a quick sideline uh, measure of, um, of cognitive function in the athlete. Uh, you see the questions there, they relate to uh, the situation the athlete is, uh, is in. Uh, and uh, you can you, you get a very quick picture of whether the whether the patient is disoriented or not immediately after the incident. One criticism of Maddox's questions is that it very much relates to team sports like handball, but perhaps not so useful in other sports uh, where concussions also happen. Let's say, for instance, alpine skiing. Uh, but you can easily modify the questions to fit that uh, situation uh, as well, I would, I would think. Now, the second page is about, uh, now we're on the, on, the, on the assessment tool that you would use uh, after an incident has happened, not as a sideline kind of a thing. And it has uh, several sections. So the first is the background section here. And the next is the symptom scale. So the symptom scale has 22 items where you score yourself from no symptoms to severe symptoms on a, on a scale from zero to six. And what we are actually going to do right now is that you are going to be doctors and patients. You're going to find the SCAT tool that's on your table and you're going to pair up two and two one of you will pretend to be the patient, and the other will pretend to be the doctor. Uh, and I would like you to please complete the background part, the symptom evaluation part, so until and through point three on page two here with your colleagues. Please. Remember, one of you is a doctor and the other is a patient.
patient, doctor. everyone. I realize that you may not have completed all the questions uh, on the symptom scale yet. You're doing very, very well. Thank you for participating. Now, in order to get the participation of everyone, I have now tricked you. I've tricked you. Because the appropriate way of doing this is not for the doctor to be asking the questions of the patient, but the appropriate way of doing this is to actually give the form to the patient and have the patient fill out the form themselves. And this is really important, really important. Now I tricked you to get you involved, so that's all right. But the question is, how many of you scored Zero. How many of you got a zero score? Hands up. How many of you did not get a zero score? You completed it, but you didn't get a zero score. Quite a few of you, right. So one important thing is when you interpret this, you should not expect a score of zero. If you take healthy, non-concussed college students, only 40% can be expected to score zero, six out of 10 will have a score higher than zero. And some of you may have had a lot of symptoms score down there. We are different. And this is why a baseline examination may be relevant to do in a group of, let's say, high risk athletes, high risk for concussion. So a return to baseline may be different than zero. And the reason why the athlete or the patient should do this themselves is that we know that they're much more likely to tell the truth to the paper than to the doctor. And especially with a serial measurement, they will understand that this is helpful for their management and they are much more likely to tell the truth to the paper. So they should complete this themselves. Then when you've done this, there are a couple of additional questions. Two things we're looking for are, do symptoms get worse with training or with physical activity? And the second is, do symptoms get worse with mental activity? So that's watching television, playing computer games, going to school, reading, uh, that type of thing. And then there's a final question here. If you know the athlete, if you know the patient well, are they different than what they normally are? which is a very good indicator of uh, concussion in my uh, experience. So now we're going to move to the next part of this, and this is the cognitive assessment. And before we start, I will explain how you do that, all right? 
So the first question are about first questions are about orientation. They're simple. The second question is about immediate memory. And you will find the instructions on page three on how you phrase the questions. So for example, with immediate memory, you would read out the question as follow. I am going to test your memory. I will read you a list of words, and when I'm done, repeat back as many words as you can remember in any order. So this is the, the word list here, elbow, apple, carpet, saddle, bubble, all right? The patient will repeat them back to you, and then you will repeat this once more. Regardless, if they got all, all, of, all five right, you will do it twice, and you do, you'll do it three times, and you'll score them each time. The next test of concentration is digits backwards. Again, the instructions are on page three on how you do it. And then the last time is months in reversed order. All right? So at this point, and now you are doing it with the patient, so you're asking these questions. So again, we're going to use a few minutes. Get ready, go. And you will understand why you should be doing this in a quiet environment, okay. Okay, get started. if you have to do it more, um, if you have to, so next time. Ah, it will be this and this and this. Okay. Three times. So <laughs> now we read this three, time, three times, three times, three times. Same words, three times. And then after three times, he gives me back as much words as he can. First, you, re you read the words to him once, he reads them back. You read them to him, he reads them back. You read them to him, he reads them back. Same words each time. So can I, can I interrupt for just one second? Just one second, just to clarify. When you read the word list, elbow, apple, carpet, saddle, bubble, you do that once. The patient reads them back to you. Then you read them again, the patient reads them back to you. You read them again, the patient reads them back to you. And you score four points if you get four right, 
three points if you get three right, and a total then of 15 if you get all five right three times. Okay, please continue. Thank you very much again for your engagement. So there have been a couple of questions as I go through the room. So let me just clarify that. One of the questions is, why do we have these alternate word lists over here? Well, let's say you're examining this patient every day. So on day two, then you would probably use this list. Day three, this list. Day four, this list. All right? That's why you have the old, or for some other reason where you think, well, we need to start over again. So then you'll use the alternate word list. But the original test is the same list three times read back and forward. For a total of five points, five points, and five points, so a total maximum here of 15 points. Then with the numbers here, you read them out once. So four, nine, one, he reads back three, nine, four, and gets one point, two, three, four points. A total of four points maximum here. And then for the months, if you get it right, you get one point. So uh, the concentration score uh, is then added up as a total at the bottom. Let me just turn over here. Then we're going to move over to the next part of this. So the neck examination, standard neck examination of range of motion, tenderness, and upper and lower body, uh, upper and lower limb sensation. All right? The interesting item is the balance examination. And you are now going to do the balance exam on your patient. You might want to switch now so the other guy becomes a patient and, the, uh, and so on. And the balance exam consists of three tests. Three tests. Each of them involves balancing for 20 seconds. So the first state is feet side by side like this double leg stance, hands on hips, closed eyes, and keeping your balance for 20 seconds. And counting errors, and there's a list of the errors, an error would be lifting your hands, lifting your foot, uh, a sidestep, uh, things like that, all right? So you're counting the errors. 
The second uh, state is a single leg stance. You ask your patient, what is your dominant foot? Which foot would you kick a ball with? And then you test them on the non-dominant foot. In a position like this, 30 degrees flexed at the hip, 45 degrees flexed at the ankle, and again, closed eyes. And barefooted, actually, but you don't have to take your shoes off for this demonstration. And then the third st uh, state is a tandem stance. So this is the non-dominant leg in the back, the dominant leg in the front, hands on hips, and again, 20 seconds. All right? Please, go ahead. But it's very, very little. Yeah, it's very little. So every, each test with closed eyes, 20 seconds closed eyes, counting errors. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please uh, have a seat. Number seven. Number seven is a traditional coordination examination. So the athlete should be able to you tell the athlete to sit, sit, arms straight out, finger pointed, close eyes and touch nose. Notice how I have my eyes open. Five times in less than four seconds. And again, you count errors. Closed eyes five times in four seconds or less. And the final item, which you are now going to do, we're going to go back to who was the first tester, and you're not going to look at the paper, and you surprise the athlete testing delayed recall. So now you ask, 
What were those five words again? All right, please test your partner. Thank you. All the instructions for how you score, all the instructions for how you score are on page three. And the one thing I would say as a non-expert, but as a clinician working with athletes with concussion, is that this has helped my management of athletes with concussion tremendously. I used to ask, how do you feel? And they'll say, oh, I feel fine. But asking the questions about symptoms and doing the cognitive testing, you can really monitor progress and detect dysfunction in athletes in ways that were not possible before we have this tool. So I would encourage you to have this available in your office and in your bag and use it in all cases of suspected concussion as you follow up the athletes. The final word is that this has been made for adults, meaning 13 years and older. So if the child is below 13 years, there is a child scat where the questions are modified to fit to that age group. And the final slide is that all of these resources are available on the BJSM website. You can download this and use it and copy it as much as you want to. Thank you very much for your participation.